Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Greg from Plastic Free Chesterfield and uh, we've been running webinars all um, over the last year and a, and a bit and you can check all our webinars out on our Plastic Free Chesterfield uh, YouTube channel and the yeah we've got some we've had some really great speakers over the last year and um, we've just kind of you know now we're going to get back into autumn again we're going to be running some more webinars as well so to stay tuned for those as well so that'd be really cool um, so tonight um, like I yeah we've kind of chosen the subject around plastic bottles and sustainability um, it's something that I've kind of been interested for a while um, kind of just sort of seeing a lot of messages on plastic bottles and I've started to um, started to follow the work of Plastics Rebellion which you'll be able to hear a little bit later on so um, but uh, just just for those who don't know Plastic Free Chesterfield we're um, one of over 800 community groups all over the UK who were part of the Service Against Sewage Plastic Free Communities Network and we're working with all lot different groups and, and everyone involved in the local community to reduce our single use plastic in Chesterfield. So we're working with schools, businesses, community groups, churches, organizations, charities, everyone really in the community to work to reduce our single use plastic. And we want to recognize everyone who is. So we're kind of celebrating everyone on our website and awarding those who are making the swaps away to reduce the single use plastic. And we've been going for two years and we're kind of, we've become, an in May this year, we become a plastic-free accredited community. So we're, we're doing really great work, um, but it doesn't stop there because Chesterfield is quite a big place. So lots lots more work to do. So that's that's who we are. And then I'm going to, um, I'm going to now pass over to Dave. Um, so Dave, Dave Lamont, he's from Plastic Free Home. He's a marketing professional. Um, he launched uh, the Plastic Free Home in December 2018 with the aim of finding sort of like-minded Facebook followers. Um, if you haven't liked the page, we can kind of send the link and Dave will sure send the link later on. Um, but the, the page has got about 35,000 followers and the website, the blog got about 25,000 visitors. And um, yeah, and he's, he all runs it as a volunteer, which is great. And all about sharing information on how we can all work towards living more sustainably. So um, yeah, and Dave's done some really great talks and, and uh, some really great work. So um, I do follow the page and I think it's really, really great. So I'd like to introduce Dave now to talk to us a little bit more about this issue around plastic, plastic bottles and sustainability and his, his views on what's going on really with, with all of this, with all these changes we're starting to see. So over to you. Uh, Lovely. Uh, thanks very much, Greg. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Hopefully it will be an interesting chat. I'm sure some of it will be uh, things that you're aware of have come across before, but I think it'd be an interesting chance maybe to debate or, or answer any questions as we go along. Do chip in, unmute yourself if you've got a question, an observation, um, something you want to share. Uh, that's absolutely fine. And we will start with a couple of very quick questions just to get us in the mood. So if you could just unmute yourself if you want to chip in and answer um, as, as we get into that. So I'll just share some slides and we will um, we'll get going. OK, can I get some thumbs up just to confirm that you can see that all fine? Fantastic. Thank you. OK, yeah. So as Greg said, my name's Dave and um, essentially I set something up called Plastic Free Home uh, getting on for three years ago. And at the time, really, it was just, as many of you have done, uh, a way of reaching out, of finding like minded people of seeking and sharing ideas and of learning and teaching ourselves uh, on our sort of sustainability journey. As Greg said, I work in marketing. I don't have a sustainability background. And I think that's the point really. Um, it's, it's very much about what any of us can teach ourselves, teach and share with one another. Um, and, and that's really the aim of Plastic Free Home. So we have lots of fantastic communities like Plastic Free Chesterfield and others engaged with us we have people following us around the country and indeed in 
in over 20 countries. And we've, um, we're just about to reach our, our 35,000 followers, which is a long way from where we were when we began, when my wife and I were chatting that Christmas 2018. It was on the back of um, David Attenborough's various uh, documentaries and talks that year. I think that was quite a poignant and, and, and sort of watershed moment for many of us. And at the time we said, let's give this a go. And if we find 100 people, then it's probably worth keeping going. And there will be enough there to, to, to make it worthwhile. Uh, there we are, 35,000 people later. And it's great to see the number of people that care about these issues. And we've learned so much um, throughout that journey and continue to do so every day. As, as well as running the page on Facebook, which you can find Plastic Free Home, um, as Greg said, we have a website where we publish blogs um, whenever we get time. Um, we also write for um, a number of newspapers and magazines um, nationally and regionally, and I've popped up on BBC Radio and given uh, a wide range of talks similar to this over time. And getting more and more used to doing them virtually, I quite like to do them face to face where possible. Of course, there's pros and cons. Um, but that's why I thought we'd get started with a couple of questions, um, just so I know you're out there. So question one, if a couple of you would like to unmute yourselves and just chip in with an answer to the first few questions that we have here. How many plastic bottles do you think we use in the UK? A million? A million? A billion. A billion? Five million. Okay, so quite wide ranging guesses there. We'll come back to the answer shortly. Question two, how many plastic bottles do you think the average UK household uses annually? 50. 50. Not for me. A thousand. A thousand, okay. Again, quite wide ranging guesses. 20, 000, 20. Okay. So question question three, what percentage of those bottles do you think are actually recycled? 75 percent. 75? 2%. 10. 10. Less than half. Less than half. Okay. So I think we've got ranging from two, three to less than half to 75%. Uh, and the final question, how long can it take for a plastic bottle to break down? 200 years. 500 years. 500 years. Okay, so we've got two, four, 500 years there. So big guesses. Okay, let's have a look at some of the answers then. Question one. So in the UK every year, we use something like 7.7 .7 billion bottles. I don't think any of us went that high with our guesses. And that, that's a shocking figure, really. Uh, if you look at that globally, it's around half a trillion plastic bottles. So a very, very big number. Um, the average household, incredibly, uses around 480 bottles. So that's everything from your cleaning products to food to drinks, including when you're on the move at work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the average, 480, that's a big number. And I think bigger than some of you perhaps thought. And uh, at least one person guessed around half um, are not recycled. Uh, so around 45% are, are not recycled. Um, and again, a lot of that comes down to the fact, where are we when we're using those plastic items? Are we out and about? Is the recycling available? Uh, are we conscientious enough to take those items home with us, make sure that they are recycled, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, shockingly, I think you've all peppered that number, but um, up to 450 years, if, you if your plastic bottle ends up on the floor or in the ocean, chances are it will still be there when your great, 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 great grandchildren uh, are around. So that's why we want to avoid using plastic as much as we can. And certainly if we do use it, why we want to dispose of it properly. Dave, do those figures relate to all plastic bottles, not just... Um... Not just drinks bottles, but like um, milk, milk bottles and that sort of thing. Yeah, so it will generally be sort of pet type plastic. So those that your average food grade, um, you know, milk, drinks bottles, etc. Uh, lots of your household cleaning products, 
you know, the majority of, of, of bottles that you'd use day to day or in your home. Yeah. So let's have a look at some of the issues then. So what we, had, we had a question, Dave, um, in, in the chat. Right. Is that 7.7 .7 billion each year? Annually, yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. If you if you have got any questions, I'm um, I'm not looking at the chat because I've got everything on a larger screen. So um, do unmute yourself, or if anyone wants to kindly uh, draw my attention, as Greg did, that's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's annually. So what happens next to these plastic bottles? I think one question that comes up time and time again with plastic bottled water, for example, is why does water have a use by date? If you buy a bottle of Evian or whatever brand the water is, why does it have a use by date? And it's not because the water goes off. Of course, it might taste a little bit iffy if it's been in there for years, but water doesn't go off, as we know. The reason that that, that use by date is on there is because the bottle goes off, as it were. It will begin to leach into the water that it contains and therefore not be particularly safe to drink after a given period of time. So the question is, do we really want to be drinking out of something at any point, um, bearing all of that in mind? A big problem I alluded to a short while ago is with how we dispose of these items. So already across the UK, it will vary greatly. It's something the government has declared a name to try and tackle. But depending on where you are, different types of materials, plastics, glass, food waste, whatever it might be, may or may not be possible to recycle at home uh, and at the curbside or even locally. Um, so that's the first problem. Even bigger problem and a really big problem we have in this country is if you're out and about, perhaps commuting, dropping the kids off at school, going out at the weekend, um, playing sport at your local leisure centre, if you've got a plastic bottle in your hand and you try and find a home for it, I think 90% of the time you'll see a bin that looks broadly like the one in the image there, where it's, it's everything in one bin. And that just isn't a sustainable way forward. I think the government and lots of local authorities have started to look at this issue. And there's a cost implication, of course, and certain practical implications. But we really must get to a point where our waste is sorted everywhere we look. Uh, you know, it's ludicrous. We all do it every day. We walk past these bins and we see them overflowing with cans, packaging, drinks, bottles, etc. Um, and again, that's a litter problem, um, but it's it, it's also a big problem in terms of the fact that they're going into landfill or ultimately incineration. The other big problem is we've got a long way to go as a country, as most have with our recycling rate. And that comes back to some of the practicalities we've just touched on but the UK wide recycling rate is something like 45%. The absolute stars across the country are somewhere in the 50s, maybe the 60s, and some are lagging far behind. But our, our national rate is 45%, and that does lag behind certain countries, particularly uh, some of those in Europe. And if any of you watched um, a couple of fantastic documentaries, including those on the BBC in the last few years, quite a lot, of emphasis was placed on where does our waste go, where does our recycling end up, and I think we're all familiar with those big mounds of plastic um, in Asia and other countries where our waste has been transported and sent off um, out of sight, out of mind, etc. Incredibly, two-thirds of our plastic waste is still sent abroad, and that just simply isn't good enough. We've got to reduce the overall level of waste, and we've got to learn to tackle our own problem. Uh, at home here and invest in, in those facilities. So what happens next? Well, the best case scenario, if you've taken your bottle home or if you're at home and you've got those recycling facilities curbside, the best case is that bottle will be cleaned and it will then be sorted and then shredded into flakes or pellets and reused in some way. That may be, if you're lucky, turned into a new plastic bottle, but not always, not often. It might also be uh, ground down and used for things like clothing, for drain pipes, for garden furniture, for all sorts of other mass produced plastic items. Because that plastic has been shredded up, etc., uh, obviously the stability, the quality of that plastic is already uh, compromised. Therefore, it's often mixed, intermixed with virgin new plastic, 
which is again a, a part of the problem. And therefore, really, is it is it recycling in the truest sense, or is, are we downcycling by using plastic in that way? Each time we reuse plastic, it degrades, the quality is lessened, and the range of uses for that plastic are fewer and fewer, to the point, ultimately, where it will become waste. We will hit a point where that can't be ground down, reused, repurposed anymore, and it's going to find its way into landfill, into incineration, or even worse, into our oceans. And into the environment. Is it all doom and gloom therefore or are we seeing some signs of progress? Well the UK a number of years ago did declare an aim uh, and that's at government level uh, to implement a bottle return scheme. Many of these exist throughout Europe and they've been pretty successful and essentially that's where there's a levy or a, a small tax if you will placed on the cost of a plastic bottle when you buy a drink from a supermarket, a shop, wherever you are, um, and you get that money back when you return the bottle to uh, somewhere, as you see in the image there. That's actually an example in Boots in this country. So certain retailers have taken it upon themselves to introduce this on a relatively small trial basis. Um, Iceland would be another one, and some of the supermarkets have been doing so. But um, at government level, 2024 is now the earliest date by which we will have that introduced in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland, uh, as with certain other things, has been a little more progressive and actually they were due to go live with that this year, but because of everything, uh, they've given a little bit more time to things and that will go live next year in Scotland. Can I ask why, yeah. you know, because the UK was meant to go 2021, if we've been in Europe, so why have we got a massive three year delay, do you know? It's a very good question without um, a clear answer. Um, it is based on, uh, you know, the, the past 18 months. Um, it, it's not seen as a priority by some. Um, there's a big cost to it. There's a level of disruption involved, etc. Essentially, they feel that people need more time. And um, I think things, quite frankly, have just slipped. It's, it's slipped down the pecking order. That there isn't really a justifiable reason. Um, you know, if certain companies, supermarkets, etc., can get this going, um, then anybody should be able to. Um, and Scotland is very much leading the way in the UK. So there aren't any good excuses. And it is a significant delay uh, when you think this was already talked about several years ago. So really, the true delay is more like five, six years. And um, it's just not good enough. Hopefully that will be brought forward if the right pressure is applied. Um, but it's got to come from brands. It's got to come from retailers. And at the moment, it's just not happening. But as normality continues to return, maybe that, that will change. Uh, one slight positive, and I think only slight in some ways, is from next year, there will be a tax on plastic packaging in general. So not just bottles, but every form of plastic packaging with less than 30% recycled content. Where's the 30% come from? Well, there's a whole story to it. It's not a particularly interesting one or, or maybe even a sensible one. Um, is it enough is the question. So 70% of, of that plastic is still virgin new plastic. Um, I just don't think it is enough really. It will make a dent, but not a significant one. I think we have to ratchet that figure up to the point where people aren't using new single-use plastic anymore and it's all going to be as, as we have there our pet or recycled or, or, or plant-based or some other um, material. More our pet, so recycled pet and other recycled plastic bottles are appearing um, but again there are there are question marks around some of this and we'll talk about that shortly. Certain brands are doing things or professing at least to do things and that often is accompanied by quite a big PR campaign and again the free advertising alone um, is, is very valuable to some of these brands. So Evian, the, one of the leading water brands, is working on using 100% cycled plastic so that would beat the government's legislation um, and they're looking at a circular model so the bottles come back and are recycled and reused but as we said that's not always possible um, more than maybe once, possibly twice. Coca-Cola is a little different. They're actually looking at a prototype paper bottle, 
which on the face of it is quite innovative. Um, it does have a thin plastic lining, um, but it's, it's, it's certainly a better alternative in many ways than where they are with the current plastic bottles. Um, but again, is it, is it a viable solution? Many of the brands are trying, professing to try, but there are very, very few out there that are leading the way on this. And it's, it's, it's a significant issue. Isn't the Coca-Cola idea much like a Tetra Pak, though? That's yes. carbon with lining, isn't it? It is broadly similar to a Tetra Pak. It's, it's slightly different in terms of the materials, um, but therefore it, it's not as innovative, I think, as Coca-Cola would like to think. Um, and it will come with some of the same problems that Tetra Packs do because of the, the, the mixed The thing content. you said earlier about um, bottles not keeping them after a certain date, if, if they're recycled and lower sort of quality, isn't that going to be more of a worry that they'll leach sooner? Um, I, I think when they're recycled, the process they go through uh, to an extent overcomes that issue. And, and, and that's certainly partly the reason that virgin plastics will be introduced as well. Um, but it has to be a consideration, um, of course, when, as I said, the, the quality of that plastic and, and the issues around it um, when it's reused um, are many. And therefore, is it is it the best solution? Probably not. So I'm sure many of you have been debating this one recently. It had significant press coverage behind it, uh, the campaign against Yop. So uh, a particular uh, fairly well-known British comedian who had a television programme to promote, uh, took it upon himself to challenge Yop, uh, which he said he was uh, a fan of and drank. So it's a yogurt-based drink if you haven't tried it. A little bit like Yakult, I think, and others. Um, his problem was these bottles are white, so they're coloured white plastic. And yes, that makes them a little bit harder to recycle, and therefore the use of that plastic when ground down uh, is more limited. So he launched this high profile campaign, which involved a stunt on a live TV talk show, walking off on air. That gained lots of press attention. A number of days later, he came out on social media and said it was all an orchestrated stunt to draw attention to the fact that he thinks Yop should be doing better and ideally moving towards clear plastic bottles. Meanwhile, Yop's had a lot of attention, a lot of free press coverage, a lot of advertising, probably worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not more. We're all talking about Yop, including now. Some of us may never have heard of it, and we probably have now. Um, so make of that what you will. Three of the quotes they bothered me that came out of the campaign and they're on your screen there. So really my view is that the campaign and the messaging around it came probably, hopefully from a genuine place, from a good place. But is it a little bit misleading to, to make some of these statements? And does it essentially endorse plastic? Does it make it okay to go and buy a plastic bottle just because it's clear and can we get on with our lives and think great problem solved that's a clear bottle i'm drinking it i'm buying it i'm popping it in the recycling i'm not doing anything um, that could be improved upon um, and I, I think that's the wrong message it seems a very odd message many of us are moving towards refillables reusables and trying to encourage others to do the same it seems rather strange to be out there promoting clear plastic bottles which very much feels like old news We'll talk about this shortly, but it's also not just about the packaging. It's, it's about what's inside. It's about the supply chain. It's about the company involved. And there are so many factors to think about when weighing things up and the potential changes we might make every day. The big worry there for me is, is the amount of sugar that is found in yacht. Uh, public health experts have called for a change in the, in the drinkable yogurts category. And uh, it just doesn't feel like a good message all round to be promoting to a typically young audience that will be engaging with some of that content. So what is the answer? Well, as I said, reusables, refillables are clearly the very best solution. Alternatively, when it comes to drinks, cartons, so we've just talked about Tetra Packs, followed by recycled cans and then regular cans, 
are certainly better alternatives to plastic bottles. But if you are going out for the day, going to work, take a bottle, take a flask, refill it at work on the go if you can. Uh, you know, water is, is widely available and there are various apps that can show you where you can refill um, or just, just take things with you. The bottle there is, is one I personally use, one of my favorites. Um, it's, it's made from, from wheat um, and actually you can bury it in the ground minus the metal clip when you're done and it will disappear. Um, so if you're, if you're not a fan of the sort of metallic taste that some of the bottles can give you after time, then uh, I'd recommend that one is well worth trying. Uh, it's a fantastic Scottish startup uh, launched by two, two young people in their 20s, um, fresh out of university. Are you going to talk about glass milk bottles at some point or? Um, not per se, but, but what did you want to talk about with glass milk bottles? Well, <clears throat> you haven't mentioned it in the alternative. I mean, loads of people have gone back to getting milk delivered in glass bottles instead of buying it in plastic at the supermarket. Why can't yoghurt be in glass bottles? I've had it abroad. Uh, yeah. yogurt in glass bottles what well, you know there's a lot of things could go back to glass bottles yeah it's a question i mean we're, we're slightly coming on to it in, in the first bullet point on this next slide um with milk um as, as i say it's it's looking at the entire life cycle emissions and the factors involved glass isn't always the answer compared to some it depends where you're sourcing it from what the product is how it's delivered or, or bought etc um, it's obviously heavier than certain alternatives, um, but, but glass, I think, is, is generally a fantastic option, and I would always recommend it above plastic. Um, in certain instances, cans, tetra packs might be better, uh, which is, I think, why you find some of the drinks companies shying away from going back to glass uh, just yet. But in terms of at home, so personally, plastic bottles that we avoid include those that you see on the screen there. So milk, absolutely, we have that delivered. Uh, to the door along with several other products. Drinks bottles, so whether that's soft drinks, squashes, etc. There are plenty of ways you can you can do that differently, including through glass bottled products. Sauces and condiments. So if you're buying ketchup, mayonnaise, etc., I think certainly try and buy the jars and the glass bottles. Laundry detergents, fabric softeners, so many alternatives from small soluble sachets to powders etc and it's very much not just about the packaging as we go down this list it's about the ingredients the supply chain and the impact on the environment when they're released so washing up liquids again the same refillables um, many of these we refill locally at our zero waste shop uh, hand wash toilet cleaner etc etc shampoos and many cleaning products and of course some of these you can make your yourselves at home i'm sure some of you do that there are great online um, very simple recipes often involving the wondrous ingredients of bicarb and vinegar um, but some of you will be less uh, happy or don't have the time to make your own uh, there are many other great solutions that don't involve buying plastic bottles from the supermarket and as i said what's on the inside counts too so do familiar familiarize yourselves with the ingredients and in the products that you buy to day to day try and ascertain where they've been made, where those ingredients are sourced, what the supply chain looks like, and just look at the entire footprint of the products you're buying. Very weirdly, sometimes, actually the best solution might come in plastic packaging, because when you put two and two together and you look at the entire process, the plastic is a compromise, but the ingredients might be better than the next best alternative, etc. So look at the ingredients, look at their long-term effects, look at where they come from, look at the supply chain, Look at the people involved and how they're treated. Look at the accreditations that a brand and a product have. And just look at the company involved, who they're owned by, et cetera, et cetera. Do your homework. It's never just as simple as I'm swapping this plastic item to this non-plastic one. You've got to look at the whole picture. And I think too often people will forget that because plastic has been the big focus. And many of us have plastic in the titles of organisation, thing, things we're involved with but it is not just about plastic and we have to remember that. So is the hope? I talked about not many drinks companies having really nailed it 
but I think certainly one crisp company has. So if you're familiar with Walkers, as I'm sure we all are, they're owned by Pepsi, the American giant. And day to day in the UK, they make something like 11 million plastic bags of crisps. They're among one of the most littered items uh, found on beaches, found across the country. Uh, etc. Et hey, can, can we can we start to wrap it up? Sorry, I just I'm I'm keen to go and get Plastic Rebellion on. Sure. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. This is the last last slide. Yeah. Um. So those very very simply, uh, that isn't good enough. Two Farmers is is a brilliant brand launched in Herefordshire, and they've solved the problem with very few resources, without the power of Pepsi and their potatoes are farmed and grown and produced uh, into those crisps here in the UK. And the packaging that you see in his hand there is actually home compostable. So the crisps taste better, they're made and grown here in the UK, and that bag goes in a compost bin at the end. That's the aspiration we need to have for drinks, for all other products, and just to get this horrible packaging um, off of our shelves. Um, if you've got any questions generally any time about tonight or anything else we might be able to help you with, if you're chewing over some swaps or ideas and you want further information, then do follow us on Facebook, uh, check out the website or drop us an email and we'll always do our best to, to help you out. Thank you so much, Dave. That's Thank great. You. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll need to, you know, we'll, um, we'll bring you in for um, your thoughts and discussion after we hear of from the yeah. building as well. And we'll just kind of open up the discussion a bit more there really um but jane um uh, did you have a burning question i think you you put your hand up uh thank you yeah it was just about a question about tetra packs but i will just send an email thank okay. you thank you okay thanks jane sorry about that that's great um okay so that's that's brilliant thanks a lot for that and um yeah so obviously um we'll now get janet in to come and speak i've got some links to share as well. Um, so Janet, so I've got all the links and everything that you, you'd like to kind of talk about and everything. So we'll, we'll go through all of that. Um, so um, yeah, so um, Plastics Rebellion kind of was uh, formed out of Extinction Rebellion in 2020. Um, and um, I'm sure Janet will tell you more, lots of, lots of kind of um, what uh, Plastics Rebellion have been doing, um, but um, they've, Kind of done lots of things like protesting at Unilever's AGM, Coca Cola's Christmas truck tour 2019, which they ended up stopping the truck from arriving. The British Plastic Federation annual dinner, um, they've disrupted Ineos Fracking Company um, as well as Innocent Drinks. And um, I really love the work that Plastic Rebellion do, and they actually um, actually be they actually have become a award. They've won an award. Through Surface Against Sewage, the Plastic Free Awards, they won Plastic Free Heroes Award at the recent awards. So um, they're brilliant. And um, Janet has been kind of been really worried about the health impacts and effects on plastics since she was 10. So it's um, very, very passion, a lot of passion coming from, from her. So I'll hand over to her to tell, uh, tell you a little bit more about what Plastics Rebellion have been up to. So thanks, thanks for joining us, Janet. Um, thanks, Greg. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm aware that um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll um, forgive me if I I cover a lot in a relatively short space of time. So uh, it's going to sound like a massive brain fart to some people, so I apologise. But um, just picking up from uh, the other speaker, I, I, I someone asked about glass. It's... Um, Clearly it's better, but um, there's a big split in the way plastic pollution is perceived and um, our concern at Plastics Rebellion is not the, not necessarily anyway, the carbon emissions, it's the ecological and human and animal health um, risks that we're worried about. So we're worried about endocrine disrupting chemicals, we're worried about carcinogens, um, being released in the production process. We're worried about um, carcinogens being released when it's incinerated, which most of it is. Recycling is basically not happening, as you have you've just heard, not at scale. Um, so 
lots of uh, companies such as Unilever, who's one of the top 10 plastics polluters in the world, like to say um, plastic's a jolly good thing because it means in terms of transportation, it um, is less carbon intensive, but uh, that, that's a really effective cloaking device for what they're doing behind the curtain, which is committing ecocide with all their shitty chemicals and um, of course, the actual physical manifestations of plastic in the oceans and microplastics, which is a whole new hell um, that's unfolding. So um, our latest campaign, um, which I was going to talk to you about because this is about plastic bottles, was our campaign at Innocent Drinks. And um, we were all quite incensed when we saw their little drinks, um, uh, little drinks, uh, Big Dreams campaign. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the advert. It has an otter singing about fixing up the planet, which we just thought was horrific greenwashing considering their new plant in Rotterdam is producing 32,000 plastic bottles an hour. And um, interestingly, they're also talking about the uh, bottle return scheme. And uh, we say, why get so excited about what's ultimately going to be yet another downcycling scheme and just giving plastic bottles a, a brief stay of execution before they become the inevitable micro fleece or uh, road aggregate um, additive, which is going to just get run off. You know, there is no way really with plastic. So um, our unique selling point at Plastics Rebellion is that we're saying, um, true circularity doesn't have recycling. Recycling isn't really a thing for plastic. Um, these are layers of complexity that we could completely do away with. And uh, reuse and refill is really what circularity looks like. Recycling wasn't even a word until about 1920. Uh, and when it was invented as a word, it actually just meant reuse. Um, it didn't mean shredding something, melting it and turning it into something else. Um, that's not really very useful. In, uh, that's our, probably why we're a little bit controversial. Um, even in the world of activism and environmentalism, um, it's quite difficult to persuade environmentalists that recycling just isn't worth doing, <laughs> even if it works, which it doesn't. Anyway, um, on to Innocent, um, maybe Greg, we, we should show the film at this stage. I think it's towards the end of the Google Doc. Is this, is this the one, the Innocent Drinks are Guilty? Uh, yes, you'll have to enable sound sharing, I think, as well. Yes, that's Oh, the yeah, one. hang on, so, sorry, yeah, let me, um, yeah, here we go, right, here we go. Today we're um, going to sit at Fruit Towers in the lobby to deliver them a message that uh, they still haven't withdrawn their offensive greenwashing ad. Um, we're going to stay there as long as it takes, hopefully, to uh, demand to see the CEO and that he moves the ad. When I first saw it, I just thought this is a new low in greenwashing. It's, it's, it, there's a song called Fixing Up the Planet, which implies the innocent who are owned by Coca-Cola are actually going to fix up the planet by selling fruity drinks in plastic bottles. Whoa, 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 whoa. what are we doing? I'm just singing a song about our impending doom. Yeah, and you're egging them on with the... With the guitar and everything, I know. OK, let's try this instead. Let's get fixing up the planet. Fix it up real good. Be kinder to our bodies with nature's tasty food. Reduce the bees, recycle. Because there is no planet B. If we're looking after nature, she'll be looking after me. Innocent. Little drinks with big dreams for a healthier planet. They're going to make 32,000 um, plastic bottles per hour. It's not going to fix up the planet. I'm willing to potentially get arrested because I feel that I'm powerless to do anything about this. I've, 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 I've created petitions, I've signed petitions, I've uh, written letters, I've written a letter to Innocent and hand delivered it. I've got an unsatisfactory response. The adverts are still out there, they're proliferating, the bottles are proliferating, the plastic's proliferating. 
I, I have no choice. The only thing I have now is my body and my voice with which to act. There we go. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. So, um, yeah, Innocent, you probably know, or maybe you don't, that it's owned by the Coca-Cola company. Um, well, 90% of it is, and um, started out as two guys selling drinks at a festival, um, but very quickly grew into something slightly more sinister. Um, uh, and I'm aware that time's running out, so I have got a few more films to show, but we might not have time. But um, basically, we received a, a pretty dry response. We, we gave three demands to Innocent that they discussed true circularity with us, and we've made an infographic, um, which unfortunately I couldn't share with you, but um, uh, it got published by the Green Party magazine, Green World. And uh, it's basically, the idea is that the government legislates for standardized, sturdy packaging. Could be made of plastic, which might need a, an initial flurry of manufacturing. Um, uh, they're standardized, just like beer bottles or tin cans and everything has to come in them, everything. So the only thing that will differentiate products are the sort of size and shape of these containers and paper labels. Uh, again, like tins of beans, you don't see people weeping in the aisles of supermarkets because tins are so boring. Uh, a lot of plastics manufacturers would have you believe that the reason that will never ever work is that because customers demand pink pearlized bottles for their herbal essences. Uh, simply not true. Um, it once, we believe that once consumers are educated about the dangers of microplastics and carcinogens, they'd be pretty happy, as long as the product's the same, to um, forego the look of the packaging. And these um, sturdy reusables uh, in our infographic are collected uh, curbside, a bit like recycling, but of course this isn't recycling. It takes uh, it's then taken to um, local washing facilities where high tech things like bottle brushes and hot soapy water are used to <laughs> wash them. Pretty groundbreaking stuff, this. And uh, they're then um, the empties, uh, the clean empties are taken to uh, facilities where um, they can be collected by the manufacturers. So, um, yeah, nothing happened really with Innocent. Uh, we went back and projected um, Guilty onto their headquarters, which is called Fruit Towers in London after our city and after we were, um, we were given no further action by the police, which was nice. Um, the police were very keen to show us their the reusable water bottles as well. Um, I think they quite enjoyed um, arresting a bunch of fruit as it turned out. Um, we then decided to up the protest and target the advertising agency, Mother London, who made the advert for Innocent uh, to accuse them of uh, their complicity in greenwashing. Um, I don't know if we've got time to show that, Greg. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can find it on the document. I believe it's... Mother London are a really cool advertising agency. They make really ethical ads no. and they never tell lies. No, 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 wait, it's, it's not like that at all. They're, they're involved in horrible greenwashing and, and you're encouraging them. You're singing this song with the ukulele and stuff. We should change the tune a bit, I think. Oh, what, like this? You're, you're messing up, up our minds with all your nasty ads. ads. Telling, telling us, us to buy stuff, you mercenary cads. Polluters can look greener if they pay top dosh. But it's, it's all a pack of lies and lots of greenwash. Hey. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh the, otters. the otters. Are you okay? Oh, oh no, it must be all it's that greenwash. It's going to be green a baby water. otter. Oh, no. Oh, oh. 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 Oh, I might have known. Little drinks, big plastic nightmares. Brilliant. So, um, 
Yeah, that uh, that got picked up by uh, an advertising industry magazine called Adweek, who have started to back our um, campaign against greenwashing. And uh, we've also been picked up by an outfit called Clean Creatives, who are pushing for um, more ethical behaviour by um, the advertising industry. Uh, so we've got uh, quite a few complaints now lodged with the ASA. Um, we're hoping that with these people's backing, we may get um, the advert pulled, which would be uh, pretty groundbreaking. But there was a big move um, just this week in The Guardian. There was a piece about um, advertising agencies um, beginning to try and clean up their act and a possible code of conduct as well that the ASA are bringing in a kind of a new, I can't think of the word now, but a new policy that applies directly to greenwashing. So um, these are sort of, uh, you know, I, I guess we're slightly different to your other guest, Greg, that we are definitely um, into direct action. Um, we're definitely, um, our demands are for reusability and um, refill and zero waste. We are particularly distressed by any um, emphasis by government and industry on pushing the recycling trope um, because we feel that even if it works, it's just ridiculous. There's just too many layers of complexity. Um, plus the fact that, you know, with curbside recycling, even though they're claiming that 45% of plastics get recycled, our gut's telling us that's just not the case. Um, maybe it is. I think there's just a vast difference between local authorities. Um, apparently we've heard that if it's uh, under 5% contamination, most stuff goes to incineration anyway. And I don't know about you guys, but down our street, people put stupid things into their recycling like toilet seats and old kettles, which leads us to our next problem, which is that we could laser focus and stigmatize plastic bottles and single use plastics, but that's just the top of a pyramid of horrors in plastics. Um, because there are really no end of life plans for Bratz dolls, kettles, car dashboards, uh, you know, the list goes on. I mean, what are the end of life plans for a plastic talking fish? There are none, I can tell you. And the complexity of recycling items like this is just, it's not ever gonna happen. So um, really, you know, our hardly revolutionary um, uh, premise is that we just need to cut back our consumerism absolutely drastically. And we're asking governments to set up a citizens assembly on which plastics are essential. So, you know, heart valves, water pipes, turbine blades, maybe, but there's, there's like layers and layers of other plastics which we're saying are non-essential. So bottles is just, you know, just a part of a, a growing problem, really. Um, and I think that's about all that uh, I need to say for now. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. It's really great and um, really great work. And I hope... Um, hope um, I really hope that you know you get a lot of backing and and uh, that things really start to happen. And it's really good. To, it's really, really good. I, I was reading that article that you were saying about about the um, this kind of code potential potential code contact conduct. So that's 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 quite a really good. That's quite a, a good sign that we're things are moving in the right direction. That we're going to start to see. Um, yeah, we're going to start to see action taken for businesses lying or you know greenwashing. And that's what we that's what we definitely need. We can't, you know, we because I think um, I think the I think the article sort of um, highlighted about um, what was it? I was reading. It said it was a company called food company called Gusto, who claimed that their packaging was 100 percent plastic free and recyclable. However, it wasn't. Yeah, they, they could. It was when they actually looked into it, they couldn't actually make that claim at all. And it wasn't actually truly that at all. So. I think it's really important that this new kind of code of conduct comes in to really co like call out these these kind of businesses who are trying to say that they're trying to do good. 
Um, and yeah, and I think um, like one of the things I wanted to kind of pick up on was this thing of like, why, um, you know, like this is, this is the, because uh, one of the things that bothered me was why are plastic bottle manufacturers now kind of resorting to putting uh, made from 50% plastic or made, made from 100% plastic on, on their, on their bottles. And I think is, is, and, and is that it's just, surely it's just a marketing scheme to try and make people buy more. Well, can I respond to that? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Yeah, um, we have, it's very difficult to uh, find a polymer scientist who will, um, you know, talk frankly about this stuff because Kel Sapri, most polymer scientists are working in the plastics industry, but we have an XR scientist who's been looking into this for us. And um, yeah, it's not really great news on these 100% recycled bottles because if you get 100%, a bottle made from 100% R PET, how long is that recyclable for? Um, it's, it's, it, it can only be recycled a, a certain number of times and, and that's if it has remains at 75 percent r pet or above you just think well how does that fit in with our waste stream of 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 all these other um pet plastics it's just it's just needless complexity we just need to be thinking about reduction it's just so utterly obvious um, and, and so many of these schemes are sort of another green light for plastics to continue to be produced. I think, you know, industry in, in terms of across the board plastics production is set to triple by 2050 at sort of current rate. Sorry to jump in, but I've got a meeting to go to at eight. Um, I'm just wondering if it's possible to fight the big pharmaceuticals when I grew up, all medicines were in glass bottles. So that, that would be a difficult one to sort of take back to the original, you know, glass. And um, UPVC double glazing, what on earth happens to all those window frames and things? I've got wooden windows. I'm the only person in my street. Um, but, you know, those are two things I really worry about. Thanks, really, for all the information. But I've got to go to a, an important meeting now. Thank you. Bye. No Thanks. Bye, bye. Dave, did you did you want to come in or say anything, say anything at this this point? Yeah, I think I think the point you were all just talking about with um, the labelling really and the the greenwashing around products. So um, one of the most misused symbols for me is the classic recycling symbol, the three arrows. You will find that on so many things. Uh, it will often say widely recyclable that doesn't mean very much whatsoever that means in theory somewhere somehow this could be recycled if you're lucky it doesn't mean you can recycle it in your curbside box or take it to your local tip um california has actually done a big bit of work on this recently and they're looking to ban the use of that symbol or to regulate the use of it in some way and i think we've got a tremendous job to do in this country uh, looking at all of these accreditations some of which are actually made up by the manufacturers or the owners of brands themselves to accredit themselves um we, we we've got to look at how the labeling is being used so at least where people are using plastics and, and items that aren't great they are they are going somewhere um with the hope that they might be reused repurposed recycled at least in the short medium term i think it's a very big problem to undo and um we've got to take some steps in a positive direction Absolutely, yeah. Um, Dave, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Great. Yeah. yeah. Firstly, to agree with Janet about uh, the need to focus on the reduced part of this message. Uh, speaking as a retired teacher whose first reduced, reuse, recycled lessons in 1991, um, you can imagine how frustrated I am as a lack, uh, the lack of progress in the last 30 years. But I'm afraid I may have got them, we may have got the message wrong in those days by starting with reduce, reuse, recycle, because people tend to hear the last word, recycle, and not hear the first word, the most important one. So perhaps we should turn it down to recycle, reuse, reduce. But I don't know if you're aware of, um, of what the government 
of uh, are, are doing. Um, a few months ago, I, I took part in the uh, consultation, the government consultation on their waste reduction strategy. I don't know if anybody knows here. I don't know if anybody else took part in that that uh, uh, consultation. Um, I don't know how many people know that the government actually has a waste reduction strategy, but a lot of the things, and I, I'm no apologist um, for, the, for, the, for the Tories and, and uh, what they do or don't do, um, but some of the things they were saying in this consultation were, were pretty good. Uh, and they had a whole section on, on plastics and, or, or on uh, single use plastics. And, um, they were talking about making the, the producer responsible. And that's what, that's a large part of what we have to do. We as consumers have got to stop consuming, but, but also we've got to stop uh, the producers from producing this rubbish. And um, if, we, if we make them financially responsible for it, then that, that surely is going to make a difference. So the government are saying some of the right things. The, the proof will be in, in actually whether they take any action. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think uh, the yeah yeah Janet Janet, you want to come come in on this? Oh uh, yeah. Um, there's also something they've published called the UK Plastic Pact. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's um, it's fantastically ambiguous. I mean, it, it's got more paperwork than Nuremberg trials. It's got portals within portals, but really it boils down to four promises. Um, well, they've got so many loopholes in mean, it, it's fantastic. One of them, for example, is to have 100% um, of all plastics will be compostable, recyclable or reusable but it doesn't break down which percentage of those it's going to be so they they're probably all going to that means 99 percent of them could be recyclable which if we're to believe a lot of the industry many of them are now but it's just not happening because they actually you know they can say they're recyclable but that doesn't mean they have to recycle them so um yeah the, the uk plastic Pact is particularly um, it's a it's a good insomnia cure. Oh, but the other thing was, and um, I just wanted to let people know, I put in two articles that I referred to. One is the one that we wrote for the Green Party about um, uh, what true circularity could look like. In other words, the idea for standardised packaging, and the other one is uh, from a magazine called The Conversation, which was about the importance of not just stigmatizing single use plastics. It's, um, yeah, the bad news is it's bigger than just that. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, that's great. Can I just make one, one small addition to what Janet was saying? I thought she made an excellent point about looking at, do we really need these items when it comes to plastic? You know, are they essential? And I think that's the big problem with the way that most of us, the governments, the world generally is tackling the problem we all face, is it's hell-bent on finding a way to carry on as we were with marginal tweaks around the edges. Um, and, and sadly, the fact is we do have to make sizable fundamental changes that involves far less consumerism um, and really looking at what we essentially do and don't need. And that isn't popular with companies and brands that obviously um, make their money through through those means but I think that's the state of where we're at in terms of an emergency and we need to 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 really tackle it in a slightly different way. Can I ask um, what both of you think about that the, the this new loop um, loop UK scheme like because obviously um, you know like um, if, if, if anyone hasn't heard of loop it, they're trying to encourage you to buy uh, products in reusable containers and then you drop you drop off your dirty containers back, back at them, and I know Tesco is kind of picking up on this. So, you know, you you can you know Tesco is try, trialing this in a number of stores where you, you go and pick up some products and reusable containers. You then drop off your container, your dirty container back at the end, and then they, they reuse it. And it's you know trying to kind of create a circular economy through reusing rather than kind of continuously, yeah, rather than the recycling kind of side of things. Can I, can I just go, go first with a very quick answer? Because I suspect Janet's probably got a, a tougher <laughs> stance than, than, than mine. 
Uh, I think very simply, the way I tend to look at things and always talk about on our page is really looking at things as a spectrum. So there's the very bad end of things and then there's mm-hmm. perfection. It's very hard to achieve perfection. We know that. Um, so this is a step in the better direction. I think anything that reduces the amount of plastic overall that we consume um, and, and that improves the picture is better. So many of us are probably reusing, refill things more and more. And I think I think that has its place, uh, whether it's the very long term solution, time will tell. Um, but I think it's better. It's it's far from perfect, but it's better. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And I also think it's important because even if they do sometimes seem a bit tokenistic, these little schemes are something that stand as points of reference. So, you know, you, you need something to be able to point to when you're maybe, you know, creating policy where you can say a bit like the loop scheme. Um, but having said that, you know, um, it seems to me that lots of these um, efforts at refill stations in places such as Asda and Morrison's, um, as soon as you put something up like that against the ease and the cheapness of plastic wrapped um, multi-packs of veg, uh, you know, inevitably they'll do a survey. Kel Supri, it will come out that the shoppers have said, yeah, it was all very nice, but it's a bit time consuming and we'd rather pay for the cheap stuff that's in plastic. So, you know, if you're going to if you're going to be a slave to the god of choice, which I think is possibly toxic, it's like, you know, you're you're laying yourself open to the possibility that the bad choice is always the one that's going to get picked. It's like sort of saying to a toddler, would you rather have, you know, a healthy lunch? or just eat sweets for the whole day, <laughs> guess what? They're gonna choose the sweets at some point. You have to like take away the toxic choice. Um, but that's just a bugbear of mine anyway, you know. I think yeah, no, like, I think, sorry, yeah, go on. I was just gonna say, it's, it's also not for me just about the packaging, it's about the products, the companies, the ingredients, the supply chain. And in many cases, it doesn't overcome that side of things. It's the same stuff going yeah, out there um, and also what you know how have they been transported and delivered and what they've been decanted from I spoke to somebody earlier today who said to me it's great I don't go and buy a hand wash bottle anymore I buy a massive bottle and then I pour it into my smaller bottle and I said to them what happens to the bigger bottle well that goes in recycling you probably find that's actually harder to recycle because it's heavier duty plastic um, and it's probably an equivalent amount of plastic so it's it's kind of switching the problem, not solving it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I buy like I, I from my zero waste shop. I get the I get the um, the five liter one and decant it. But I never I don't I don't recycle the five liter. I just I drop it back off to the zero waste shop and they refill it. Yeah. Again for someone else, you know. So it's not you know that's I mean that's the way forward. It's don't yeah. put anything in a recycling. Can I get it get it back for reuse? and refill that's got to be the way forward isn't it so yeah. um, there's there's a lot in the chat about tetra packs um something about can you tell us more about tetra packs good or bad or re- recyclable yeah janet you just replied don't you yeah it's funny i i talked to an old bloke down my road who was driving the viola viola van for Brighton, um, by the way, Viola in Brighton, uh, somebody whistle blew two years ago to say that all the household curbside recycling collections were just going straight in the incinerator. But anyway, this guy, um, I said, yeah, I see Tetra packs in everyone's um, recycling. He went, what are they? So I said, oh, these things. And he went, oh, no, no, no. Well, we don't recycle it anyway. And I said, no, please tell me. <laughs> you're not <laughs> just incinerating it all and he said well look he said most of the stuff in all of your recycling bins all along your road isn't recyclable uh but i do happen to know that tetra packs um i think they're only recyclable by i i've, I've i think it's four places but i'm not sure if i've got that right but it's not many because once you bonded plastic to cardboard it's um it's a it's a fresh hell. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, like, because I used to, I used to get, um, t like, I used to buy, like, vegan uh, milk in Tetra Packs, and I now, I just couldn't stand it, but the amount, the amount I was getting through was mad, so now I'm really happy that I can get oat milk in glass, glass milk bottles, and that's great, <laughs> that's a good thing for me, yeah, so, yeah, um, that's, that's a really great thing that people can do, just because it just makes you realise when you start adding up just how much you're using, it really, yeah, it really starts to think that if that's just one person using that many type of packs for example then uh yeah then hopefully people can start switching to glass milk bottles that'd be great um yeah oh there was there was a question earlier on about um from simon who was saying are canned drinks better to have than to uh, better to be having than plastic and is glass best overall we kind of we we did kind of touch on this a little bit earlier, didn't we, Dave? Yeah. So um, ideally, if they're recycled cans, ideally 100% recycled, then yeah, that's better. Uh, if they're part or non-recycled, so new uh, cans, then uh, they'll still be better than plastic because a can could be turned into a can in in the space of weeks. You could find it's back on your shelf, um, and it doesn't have the issues with with recycling it that plastic does. So. Um, if you're out and about and you really need a drink and you haven't taken a bottle with you, then yeah, I would absolutely aim for a can, not a plastic bottle. Yeah. Oh, well, and Laura, don't don't worry about um, you know like things things um, maybe all the all the all the all the stiff, scary stuff we're 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 sharing. You know, like there's some really like you said, there is some really great work happening. You know, we are seeing the the, the issues about the to put, you know, the um, responsibility, producer, you know, producer responsibility stuff coming through. We're starting to see the ASA kind of crack down on greenwashing. Um, and we're starting to see lots more people switching to refills and refill revolution using the zero waste shops. So, you know, there's there's a lot of really great stuff happening. And, um, you know, we are like, we are starting to move to a more re refill um, kind of way of living. And um, I did actually want to get, there is an organization, if you don't, if anyone doesn't know, there is an organization called City to See who run the refill program. So you can download the refill app on your phone and they will, that you can look up where you can refill in your local area. So, um, you know, that, that's really, really, that's really, really great. So, uh, you know, there is, it's things, things are, things, we're, we're making good progress. And can I just speak to um, Laura? To Laura's um, comment. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say um, two things. First of all, uh, Greta Thunberg was inspired to actually stop eating and start worrying about the ecological crisis when she saw the amount of plastic in rivers. Um, and I'm sure you know this, but one of the ways in which to combat the grief which is a very natural response to this because it's shit, is to get up and do some direct action. Um, it's not necessarily gonna make it go away, but I think there's something about understanding that we are probably fucked and then living without fear and uh, knowing, you know, it's better to do something than nothing. Um, it certainly made me feel better anyway. Um, yeah absolutely yeah we just got to keep keep uh, keep challenging it you know like um you know in chesterfield like i'm going to keep like we've got um we've got an, a business called um robinson's packaging they're not they're not actually they're not actually robinson the drinks robinson but they're they're called robinson packaging and you know we're going to be calling out on we're going to be calling out their greenwash because it's like they're saying that up there, they've put, they've created a new sustainability goal, which is to ensure that all of their plastic packaging is 100% recyclable, um, and that was it in their sustainability plan. But it's you know I think like we want to you know I think it's it's about challenging these manufacturers. Like if we write if we write to them, if we kind of tweet at them, if we, you know lots of people kind of make some noise, then you know they're going to start listening to the people and they'll start realizing that people don't want to continue using plastic containers um, and continue using plastic packaging because you know then they'll know that they're never gonna they're, ne they're not gonna have a good business model if they 
want to keep producing plastic, even if it is recyclable plastic, it's, it's never going to be the, the solution. And so, you know, businesses need to kind of get on board now. We've got this new plastic packaging tax coming in April next year. So, you know, like we're going to be writing to businesses and saying, get out of single use plastic now, because, you know, there's plastic packaging taxes coming in next year. And, and plus, you know, so, you know, it's, it's only going to become worse for businesses who are continuing to use plastic packaging. So get out now and, and start, yeah, just start getting, 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 doing good things. Um, yeah. Greg, I have to go to another meeting now, but I, if, I, if you don't mind, if I could just say two last things. One is anyone is welcome to not only join Plastics Rebellion if you want to do some direct action, but we, we're encouraging people we're decentralized and autonomous to start your own local group we can give you tons of literature stickers flyers leaflets posters and you can go off and do your own thing um, we're very happy for people to act on the umbrella of um plastics rebellion um clearly you know they've got you guys as well with the, who are a font of knowledge so you know if if some guys want to go a, a very good way into direct action is actually just setting up a table on the street and you know, talking to people, but um, that was the first thing. And the second thing, I think I've forgotten it. Oh, it was to say that the British Plastics Federation are a very powerful lobbying presence and they will be uh, lobbying against, they will be lobbying to get that tax reduced. In fact, they have been. Uh, so they're, an, they're another legitimate target, which we are targeting at their annual dinner in October so feel free to um, either join or join a Twitter storm that evening um, hopefully we're going to make some waves so thank Absolutely. you. Yeah no uh, Janet definitely sh share um, uh, if you want me to share some details of Plastic Rebellion or like how people can get, get involved or stay in touch you know what's the best way for people to, to kind of stay in touch with Plastic Rebellion? Uh, yeah, I'll put uh, an email address for us in. Um, actually, you've got a nice shareable document there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll put our email in the chat and I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but thanks so much for having us and I'm going to have to go to another Zoom now, but I'll pop this oh, in the chat. Thanks. thanks so much, Janet. It's brilliant. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. guys. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. And Dave, did you want to um, say anything before, um, final wrap up before before we um before we finish um i haven't got anything major to add other than it, yes it is very easy to get quite gloomy when we talk and think about these things and the news is is quite depressing um but things are happening and we can all make a difference we can all do something and the cumulative impact of that in time can be quite significant um and i think it's it's with your feet really you know whether it's which supermarket you shop at where you source things, which brands you buy from, um, the more and more cumulatively that we, we take that spend away from some of those, they will have no choice but to make big changes. And, uh, and I think that's the way to do it. And some of those changes are difficult and they take a bit of determination, um, but, but stick at it. And uh, I, I think, you know, don't, don't lose hope, just keep going. And, and thank you, thanks for, thanks for having me this evening. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's, that's amazing. So thanks a lot. Um, we'll, um, so we'll share all the details. So all the links, I'm going to save the chat and um, all of the contact details for Plastic Rebellion and Plastic Free Home. We'll share all of that and I'll put it all um, in an email to everyone who's joined and um, we'll share all of that out um, and uh, do kind of stay in touch. Stay in touch with Plastic Free Home, stay in touch with Plastic, Plastic Rebellion and um, yeah, keep following, you know, what's going on. There's going to be lots of exciting kind of changes coming in and uh, yeah, sort of watch the space really. Um, and in terms of Plastic Free Chesterfield, stay in touch with us as well. We've got some, um, we've got um, another really great webinar coming up next month on 20th of October, where we're going to be looking at um, the really great work of Ghost Fishing UK, who are trying to rescue uh, all of the plastic um, that's been dumped in the sea and um, causing um, uh, issues to wildlife and, and animals there. So that's on the 20th of October um, and that's Ghost Fishing UK who are uh, oh, another winner of the Plastic Free Awards. So um, really, really great to have that. So thank you so much for everyone for joining and it's really great to, to see everyone. And um, yeah, it's been great. So thanks very much. <laughs>